Hi friends, Benjamin is with you and today I will tell you another heartbreaking story. Michelle Marie Summers was born in 1957, the daughter of Milton and Helen Summers. Michelle grew up in Concord, California, where she played violin, acted, and was a cheerleader and homecoming queen. Excelling academically with straight A grades, Michelle was also a devout member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Her diverse experiences included being an exchange student in Switzerland, pursuing a career in modeling, and earning the distinction of Miss Concord in 1976. On April 11, 2007, Michelle McNeil, a 50-year-old resident of Pleasant Grove, Utah, USA, was recuperating at home following surgery. Her daughter, Alexis Summers, initially cared for Michelle after her hospital discharge, and later, Michelle's husband, Dr. Martin McNeil, assumed responsibility for her well-being. Michelle and Martin's union originated from their meeting at an event for young Mormon singles, leading to their marriage when Michelle was only 21 years old. Nearly three decades later, they remained married. Martin, a practicing psychiatrist, and Michelle, a former beauty queen turned model, shared a desire for children, ultimately expanding their family to include four biological children within a brief five-year span after marriage, in addition to adopting four children, three of whom hailed from Ukraine. On the 11th of April, Martin escorted his young daughters to school, leaving behind four adult children and four minor children residing at home. The day before, Alexis, who had departed to resume medical school, phoned Michelle at 8.45 a.m. to check on her well-being. Michelle assured Alexis that she was doing well. Just over a week prior, on April 3rd, Michelle had undergone a facelift, and she was under prescription medication with instructions to rest. Alexis had cared for her for a few days before returning to school, and Michelle informed her that she felt good and intended to pick up the girls from school later that day. After dropping the girls at school, Martin went to work, where he received an award in the morning and requested a photographer present to capture a photograph of him. Following the award ceremony, he retrieved his daughter at 11.30 a.m., and they headed home. Upon their return, calls to Michelle went unanswered, prompting Martin and his daughter to search for her in the house. In the bathroom, they discovered Michelle submerged in the bathtub, fully clothed. Martin instructed his daughter to seek assistance, and she hurried to a neighbor's house. Simultaneously, Martin dialed 911, informing the dispatcher that he was performing CPR. He also contacted a colleague, notifying him that he was conducting a code on his wife. When Alexis reached Martin by phone, he conveyed the distressing news. Your mother's in the tub, and she's not breathing. Concerned neighbors rushed into the bathroom to offer aid and witnessed Martin bent over Michelle's face. Michelle lay face up, with her head positioned under the faucet, and her legs and feet were inside the bathtub. With the assistance of the neighbors, Michelle was lifted out of the bathtub, and Martin initiated CPR. Upon the arrival of paramedics, they took over the resuscitation efforts. During this process, a gurgling sound was heard, and Michelle expelled a substantial amount of fluid from her mouth multiple times. Martin informed the paramedics that he hadn't been away from the house for long, speculating that Michelle might have overdosed on her pain medication and slipped in the tub, hitting her head. According to Martin, when he discovered Michelle, she was slumped over the bathtub with her lower body outside the tub. Michelle was declared dead upon arrival at the hospital. The medical examiner, Dr. Maureen Fricka, concluded that Michelle's death was natural, attributing it to cardiovascular disease with hypertension and myocarditis. Within nine days of Michelle's funeral, a woman named Gypsy Gillian Willis moved into Martin's residence. Initially, Martin informed his children that he had hired her as a nanny to care for the remaining four young children at home. However, Martin's adult children were troubled by the situation. When Alexis questioned him about his relationship with Gypsy, Martin instructed her to leave the house. It later became apparent that Gypsy was not functioning as a nanny. Instead, she was residing with Martin as his partner. 
They traveled to Wyoming together, where Gypsy introduced Martin to her family as her fiancé and even adopted the name Gillian McNeil. Astonishingly, Martin proposed to Gypsy just three months after his wife's death. Alexis, along with her sister Rachel and Michelle's sister Linda Clough, harbored suspicions about the purported natural cause of Michelle's death and driven by their belief that Michelle was murdered, urged the police to reinvestigate the case. Their persistent efforts involved reaching out to various Utah newspapers, the governor's office, and authorities, eventually leading to the reopening of Michelle's case. Upon examination of the toxicology report from the autopsy, a toxicologist noted that, at the time of her death, Michelle's blood contained concentrations of Valium, Percocet, Phenergan, and Ambien, sufficient to render her severely obtunded and difficult to arouse. Subsequently, a medical examiner, Dr. Todd Gray, reviewed the report and altered the manner of death from natural to undetermined. Michelle's cause of death was reclassified as the combined effects of heart disease and drug toxicity, departing from the initially attributed heart disease. As the investigation into Martin's background unfolded, it unveiled a life built on deceit. In his 20s, Martin engaged in fraudulent activities, writing forged checks to support a lavish lifestyle. His criminal history included convictions for forgery and grand theft, resulting in a 180-day prison sentence. Following his release, Martin pursued medical school, gaining admission based on two falsified transcripts. He had submitted someone else's transcript during the application process. Furthermore, police discovered that Martin had falsely claimed to be schizophrenic to secure a discharge from the military. Subsequently, he received $3,000 per month from Veterans Affairs for over three decades following his discharge. The police delved deeper into the investigation. Following Michelle's demise, Martin attempted to arrange for the adoption of the three children they had adopted from Ukraine. To facilitate this, he orchestrated a deceptive plan involving one of his daughters, 16-year-old Giselle McNeil. Under the guise of a summer vacation, he sent Giselle back to Ukraine. During her absence, Martin and Gypsy assumed her identity. Gypsy acquired a fraudulent social security number, Idaho cards, and birth certificate, and the two of them went to court, successfully altering Giselle's birth date by 20 years. Martin and Gypsy faced convictions for identity theft and various federal charges, both pleading guilty to state fraud charges. Following Martin's three-year prison term, he was subsequently charged with murder, a first-degree felony, and obstruction of justice, a second-degree felony. The prosecution contended that Martin committed premeditated murder against his wife. They argued that he manipulated Michelle into undergoing a facelift as part of a meticulously planned murder. According to the prosecution, Martin influenced the surgeon who performed the facelift to prescribe specific medications necessary for carrying out the crime. Their case posited that Martin drugged Michelle with these medications after her cosmetic surgery and subsequently drowned her in the bathtub at their home. The motive, as presented by the prosecution, was Martin's desire to be with his mistress, Gypsy. The court learned that Martin had actively encouraged Michelle to undergo a facelift, despite her not expressing any prior interest in such a procedure. Testimony revealed a transformation in Martin's behavior when he turned 50, including a newfound dedication to exercise, weight loss, and visits to tanning salons. Michelle, concerned about a potential affair, questioned him about his sudden fixation on his appearance. Martin responded by suggesting that she, too, should focus on her appearance and consider a facelift. In March 2007, Michelle confided in her daughter, Alexis, expressing her fear that Martin might be involved in an affair. Suspecting Martin's infidelity, Michelle examined his phone records and identified a frequently dialed number. When she confronted him, Martin dismissed her concerns, deeming them as baseless. In an attempt to divert her attention, he offered to pay for a facelift for Michelle and suggested they take a two-week cruise together afterward. Contrary to Martin's assertions, the prosecution contended that he had been engaged in an affair since November 2005 with Gypsy Willis, 
the woman he later claimed to have met only after Michelle's funeral, where he purportedly hired her as the children's nanny. The two initially connected online, and Gypsy confirmed that she was aware of Martin's marital status. According to the prosecution, Martin began plotting Michelle's murder months before her death to facilitate his relationship with Gypsy. They argued that he feigned illness to establish an alibi, making it seem implausible for him to physically carry out an attack on his wife. Martin shared conflicting health issues with different people, adopting a limp and using a cane. At church, he informed congregation members that he had cancer and less than a year to live. Meanwhile, he told colleagues varying stories about his health, ranging from a peripheral neuropathy in his toe to having cancer in his big toe and a neurological problem similar to MS. The prosecution then detailed Michelle's surgery and the events that transpired afterward, emphasizing that it was Martin's post-death actions that raised significant suspicions in the case. In March 2007, Martin organized meetings with a plastic surgeon for Michelle, actively participating in the consultations and appointments. Despite Michelle's nervousness, she agreed to undergo the surgery. Before the procedure, Martin accompanied Michelle to a visit with a primary care physician to assess the safety of proceeding. During this visit, the primary care physician addressed Michelle's high blood pressure and recommended postponing the surgery. Despite this advice, Martin and Michelle proceeded to the preoperative evaluation appointment with the surgeon, accompanied by Alexis. Before the appointment, Alexis observed Martin jotting down medications that he wished the doctor to prescribe. On the way to the appointment, Michelle expressed her desire to postpone the surgery to better manage her blood pressure. In response, Martin, angered by the suggestion, retorted, If you don't have the surgery now, you're not getting it. Typically, post-facelift, the prescribed medications include a pain reliever, an antibiotic, a sleeping medication, an anti-inflammatory, and an eye ointment. However, Martin requested additional and stronger medications from the surgeon, including oxycodone, a more potent pain reliever, liquid Lortab, and an increased quantity of Phenergan and Valium, an anti-anxiety drug. The surgeon agreed to these requests, cautioning Michelle to take each pill separately and to avoid taking all of them together. Michelle underwent the surgery two days later, which was planned as a one-day procedure. She expressed her wish to stay overnight in the hospital, but Martin, displaying displeasure, insisted on her going home. The surgeon intervened, insisting that Michelle stay overnight. She was eventually allowed to return home the following day. Upon Michelle's return home, Alexis noticed that she seemed excessively sedated. When she inquired about it, Martin explained that he might have administered too much medication. Concerned about her mother's well-being, Alexis offered to take charge of Michelle's medication. Michelle herself disclosed to Alexis that Martin had given her an excessive amount of medication, leading to vomiting. To safeguard against potential over-medication, Michelle requested Alexis to let her feel each pill so she could identify them, given that she still had bandages on and couldn't see at that stage of her recovery. In the ensuing days, Michelle's recovery progressed positively. As her bandages were removed, she regained independence and mobility. She even started to reduce the prescribed dosages of her medications. Despite Michelle's improving condition, Martin requested the surgeon to refill prescriptions for Percocet and Phenergan. The surgeon complied with this request. Alexis returned to school, believing that Michelle was recovering well and able to manage on her own. Unfortunately, the next day, Michelle was found dead. The jury learned about the peculiar events surrounding Michelle's discovery in the bathroom. Martin's youngest daughter reported that on the day of Michelle's death, Martin had picked her up from school, and upon their return home, they found Michelle in the bathtub, fully clothed. According to reports, Martin called 911 but initially provided a false address and abruptly hung up. During the second call, he stated, My wife has fallen in the bathtub. She is unconscious. She's underwater. Martin informed the dispatcher that he couldn't lift Michelle, so he was draining the bathtub, and then he hung up. The dispatcher called back, but Martin once again hung up. Witnesses, 
including neighbors, saw Michelle in the bathtub. One neighbor testified that they performed chest compressions while Martin leaned over Michelle's head to administer rescue breaths, but they did not observe his mouth making contact with Michelle's mouth. It was only when the paramedics took over CPR that Michelle's color changed and a gurgling sound was heard. The jury was informed about discrepancies in Martin's account of how Michelle was found compared to others' recollections. Martin asserted that she was hunched over the bathtub, with the lower half of her body not in the tub, a stark contrast to his daughter's and neighbor's descriptions. Additionally, the emergency room doctor noted no injuries on Michelle, consistent with a fall into the bathtub. Upon Alexis's return home after learning of Michelle's death, she discovered that Michelle's medication, as well as other items like the hospital bed and blankets, were missing. In the garage, Alexis found a pile of wet towels, clothing, and the bathroom rug. Martin's son, Damien, and his girlfriend, Eileen, returned to the house after Michelle's death. Martin asked Eileen to flush Michelle's pills down the toilet. Eileen testified that she complied and noticed that some of the pill bottles were nearly empty. Contrary to Martin's claim of blood everywhere, she observed no trace of blood in the bathroom. The court heard that on the day Michelle died, Martin spent extensive time communicating with Gypsy, speaking twice on the phone and exchanging 30 text messages. The prosecution presented a cardiologist during the trial who testified that the inflammation in Michelle's heart was benign and not severe enough to pose a significant risk of cardiac death. Additionally, an expert in forensic pathology provided testimony indicating that there was no evidence of myocarditis, challenging the initial cause of death determination. Instead, the expert suggested that drowning might have been the cause of death, citing five key points. First, during CPR, Michelle regurgitated substantial amounts of water, indicating that she had swallowed water. Second, water was found in Michelle's airway, suggesting she had inhaled a significant amount of water. Third, Michelle's lungs were twice as heavy as typical lungs. Fourth, fluid was discovered in the chambers of Michelle's lungs. Fifth, Michelle's blood showed significant dilution, a phenomenon associated with inhaling water, which then enters the blood vessels and circulates throughout the body. The prosecution presented testimony from five jailhouse informants during the trial. One inmate claimed to have seen a television show about Martin in prison and informed him about it. Initially reluctant to go into details, Martin later, according to the inmate, admitted to giving Michelle presumably oxycodone and sleeping pills. He then allegedly disclosed that he placed her in the bathtub and held her head underwater for a brief period. Another inmate queried Martin about Michelle's fate, to which Martin reportedly responded, The bitch drowned. The remaining inmates testified about Martin boasting of his ability to evade detection and expressing confidence that authorities would never be able to prove his actions. The defense argued that Michelle's death was a result of natural causes, pointing to the various medical examiners involved in the case. None of them could definitively conclude that Michelle died due to homicide. The defense contended that Michelle suffered a heart attack, causing her to fall headfirst into the bathtub. The autopsy findings noted an enlarged heart, narrowing of the heart arteries, and signs of liver and kidney deterioration. Despite the defense's argument, more than six years after Michelle's death, on September 19, 2014, McNeil was sentenced to a minimum of 15 years up to life in prison for his first-degree murder conviction, plus another term of 1 to 15 years for his conviction on obstruction of justice charges. Gypsy, on the other hand, did not face murder charges, and while some members of Michelle's family suspected her involvement, Gypsy maintained that she was unaware of any plan to harm Michelle. Martin appealed his conviction and lost. McNeil, 61, committed suicide in prison on April 9, 2017, two and a half years into his sentence. He was found lifeless on an outside yard near the prison's greenhouse. According to the report from the Unified Police Department, McNeil used a hose and a natural gas line that was providing fuel for a heater for the greenhouse to kill himself. Michelle's case might have remained closed if not for the relentless persistence of her family. 
Despite facing challenges in reopening the case, they refused to give up until the truth was uncovered. From the moment they learned of Michelle's death, the family suspected foul play, believing that Martin had murdered her. Even Michelle herself had a sense that something wasn't right during her lifetime. What do you think about this story? Share your opinions in the comments. Thanks for watching and for being with us. Take care of yourself and your loved ones.